Summer of Sonic 2016. Please welcome to the stage, Mr. Mike Pollock! Thank you so much. Let's get this over with. Have a seat, Mike. So, Mike. Yes? It's been a while yeah. for you to be coming to Summer of Sonic, but how have you been enjoying it so far? It's fantastic. It's full of people, which if it wasn't would be a big waste of our time. So thank you all for coming. But I do recall a certain year of someone that kind of looked like you coming here one time. Could you explain that? Yes, uh, a man uh, known colloquially as Pike Mollick came. Um, I was invited to attend, and then I kind of had to be disinvited because of some miscommunications with the home office. Uh, and uh, so I came as an attendee and sort of snuck around the floor saying, I'm not really here. Don't look at me. I'm not here. Of course, I have some really interesting stories of that. Uh, I don't think you recall that one moment uh, during one of the signings, which actually they're having it, having it just now with Takashi uh, Izuka mm -hmm. and Yuji Naka. Um, I think uh, I was being the bad man during that time when you, I was about to cut you off from meeting <laughs> Takashi Izuka. Yeah, there was that. I mean, how did you feel? Uh, did you feel, um, you know, a little uh, besmirched, maybe? <laughs> no, it was fine. I understood that I was there, not under false pretenses completely, but under uh, special pretenses. So, yeah, I, I, I was lucky to get as far as I did. Well, that's cool. Well, let's get the prop, uh, Q and A proper. Sure. Um, basically, we want to know who Mike Hawk is. How was he um, growing up uh, as a child in, in New York? I mean, what what was pretty much your livelihood back in the day? I was born in a lovely place. Well, I was born in a hospital, not <laughs> not just anywhere. Uh, I uh, grew up in Roslyn Heights, Long Island, a, uh, let's call it an, woo! All right, thanks. Um, if you look on the map of uh, the U.S., you focus on New York, and then you look down at the little spit of land hanging off the end of New York, Long Island, woo! We were the fancy North Shore of Long Island. Uh, fairly normal existence. Uh, Dad was in ladies' wear. It's a joke. He was in, uh, he sold bridal gowns. He made bridal gowns, sold bridal gowns. Uh, and mom was a volunteer at various hospitals. And then there was me and there was my brother. My brother is now a book publisher. If you look at nostarspress.com, he makes computery books. Check them out. Lots of Lego related stuff. And there was me. Uh, as a kid, I found out I loved radio and I loved theater. Pursued mostly theater as a kid with community theater, school theater, that sort of thing. And when the time came to figure out some type of career path, I figured, hmm, theater where you work for a few months doing a show and then you stop, or radio where you get a more or less constant paycheck working at a radio station for as long as I'll have you. So I chose radio. I went to Syracuse University in 1983 to study to be, uh, the major was television, radio, and film. I just liked the radio part. They didn't. They didn't particularly care what I was doing. When I was uh, in college, I got an internship at a local radio station where I started cataloging the record catalog. There was a wall full of records. These need to be indexed with typing on an index card because that's what you did back in the 80s. So I did that for a while until I got to the end of the, uh, of the library, uh, the record collection. I was very impressed. And then they said, OK, now what do you want to do? Well, I kind of like to learn production. So I learned how to make radio adverts and, uh, and, and promos for the radio station, did that for a while. That led to a part-time DJ gig. Hi, everybody, it's 720, 20 past seven, good morning. Did that for a while. I was gonna say you do a better DJ job than me, I do, anyway, that's Thank for sure. Thank you so much. It, it worked for a while. Um, did that mostly, uh, that was entirely part-time because there were no full-time positions. And eventually I figured I need some type of full-time work. Part-time is nice, but not really paying all the bills. So I managed to somehow get a job at a rock and roll station. Uh, the first station was in Syracuse, New York. I got to a radio station, a rock radio station in Rochester, New York, um, where I found out after about a year, as they were kind enough to tell me, you're not rock and roll enough. 
by, so I was the production director for a while, then I wasn't. Then I found out, uh, well, I'm between engagements again, what shall we do now? Thumbed through the printed newspapers at the time, this was uh, 1993, um, and found an ad for a uh, radio syndication outfit, which is essentially making radio content for people who can't make their own content. So they had us, uh, they were writing comedy bits and news stories and stuff. They needed a tape duplicator. <laughs> okay, it's work. It could eventually need to new, lead, lead to more new and exciting stuff. So I left from Rochester, New York up here, back down the New York City area, and uh, I started duplicating tapes for, oh, a year of that. And then eventually that branched off into learn, using my actual comedic uh, writing skills, writing song parodies, writing comedy bits, occasionally voicing them, not doing nearly enough voice work as I felt I should be, but that was that. Uh, in the meantime, found uh, my lovely girlfriend, now wife, found, uh, started dating, started getting engaged, and when I was finally down back in New York and having a full-time job, which happened with the radio syndication gig, got into um, a lovely marriage, thank you so much. <laughs> Big hand for marriage, thank you. Uh, then uh, the radio syndication gig, there was a brief layoff period. They were having uh, financial problems selling the company, so I was between engagements, and that proved to be a very fateful turn of events because I was suddenly without work again with the promise of being reemployed, we'll get back to you. But I said, you know what? Let's round up all of my voice work and stuff because I did voices in the comedy bits that I was writing. Let's make a demo tape of that, send it out, see who wants it. Sent out that demo tape, and among the people who wanted it were a little cartoon you may have heard of called Pokemon. That turned out to be a fateful booking uh, because Pokemon was run by the Four Kids people. Four Kids was starting their Four Kids TV block, and they were interested in filling all the roles on all their various shows. So when that started coming through, they called me in for more auditions, and that ultimately led to, among other shows you may recall, like Ultimate Muscle, where I played meat, uh, Kirby right back at you, where I played the mayor, and Samo the bartender. <laughs> Sorry for any Irish people I may have just offended. And one of the shows four kids got in their lineup was what they were calling at a secret meeting, Project X. What could that have been? Turns out it was Sonic X. They became, thank you so much. I learned they were very interested in having me audition for the Dr. Eggman role. I did uh, one audition, two series of callbacks, and eventually that convinced the friendly folks at Sega I was the man for the job. And that has now snowballed into all that you see here. Thank, thank you very much for that. Thanks very much. Uh, quick announcement. If uh, everyone, anyone's interested in the community panel, that's going to be happening at uh, the back room over there, where you get to meet such people as Tanner of uh, Tanner and Let's Plays and whatnot. You know, if you want to check them all out, you can go over there. It's a first come, first serve basis. So, yeah, check it out if you want to check it out. But back to you, Mike. Please. So, uh, so with a career, uh, how has your parents' contact supported you with your career? I mean, obviously it's radio and stuff like that. Were they supportive? Were they uh, very questionable, you know, questioning your kind of like uh, choices or did they just let you go uh, the most, for that? The, the most support they could have shown was on my graduation day because uh, after graduation, I had a shift at the radio station. So, hi, mom and dad, gotta go to work. So they were okay with that and uh, they were willing to chip in during the hard times. So yeah, they, I guess they found radio as respectable as ever. Um, and then when I eventually transferred uh, into the freelance voiceover world, they liked that too. Nice. Oh, that's good. That's good. So uh, going back to uh, how you kind of like get into voice work and whatnot, you obviously were uh, still working at the time mm -hmm. for radio and whatnot, and you were talking about that drought period. Um, so how did that pan out? It was like, you know, for your. They eventually did rehire me after the layoff, surprisingly. There was a little bit of a challenge there uh, because while I was laid off, 9-11 uh, happened uh, right in New York. It didn't directly affect the company, but there was all sorts of various other stuff going on that they kind of needed to deal with. But by the end of 2001, I was back with them doing less fun things. I was still writing song parodies and writing comedy bits, 
but they were also becoming more and more short-staffed, so they had me doing boring bits like celebrity birthdays. <laughs> Fine. But I was doing whatever they wanted me to do, and that was okay. But also by that time, four kids had started using me for things, along with a bunch of uh, anime production companies. Uh, NYAD Post was using me a lot. So while I had a full-time job, working more or less 10 to 6, uh, I was asking my boss if I could duck out several times a week for recording sessions and for auditions. And she grudgingly said okay, realizing, I guess, that I was having a lot more fun doing that than I was having doing the real live job. But that was more fun, and that had a more of a future in it. And uh, eventually, come 2008, when the syndicator had enough. And that was attracted uh, by four kids during your career with them. But that wasn't the case, really, wasn't it? It was a contract position, but it was very Four kids, essentially, where when you're dubbing something separately. So you'd record, for the case of Sonic X, Jason Griffith would come in for an hour or two. Woo, Jason Griffith! Fine. Uh, Amy Pallant as Dales would come in. Woo, Amy Pallant! Dan Green would come in as Knuckles. Woo, Dan Green! And then when they needed me, they would schedule me. So, come in Tuesday between noon and two. Okay, I can make that work. And then I would do my, my Sonic X record and go back to work where they were expecting me to be. But essentially, it's just like hiring a plumber or an electrician. You get them when you need them. You don't get them when you don't. They're not really your employee. They are your contractor on an as-needed basis. Well, during your voice, uh, voice acting career, uh, there was another name that uh, was going around during your, uh, you know, uh, for your time. Um, could you shed a little light on why you chose that name at one point in your career? Sure. Round about 2000, as dads tend to do, my dad passed away. And I figured, what better way to memorialize dad by using the name Herb Lawrence. Herbert Lawrence Pollock, Herb Lawrence in credits. So if you watch a couple of obscure animes and dubs, you'll see a Herb Lawrence credit. It's for my dad. Hi, dad. I'm sure you would appreciate it, even today, like... He um, can only hope. <laughs> Doubt he would have watched them, but that's okay. And say so the gesture was there. Sure. Was there. So uh, going back to four kids, um, you're working on some four kids projects. Obviously, Ultimate Muscles, obviously one of them, Pokemon, and all that. Uh, when it came to Sonic X, how uh, you know it's like with it, uh, how did four kids approach you with that? How uh, how was uh, how was that brought up, uh, brought upon you? when taking, uh, taking on the project more so than, you know, just going for a role or whatever. Yeah. Sure. There was uh, the really odd thing, because they never did this, there was an all-hands meeting. They called all the actors together for a meeting to discuss the future of the company, future plans, and one of the things they mentioned was this super secret Project X. They were very excited. We have Project X, can't talk about it, very excited to have it. As it turned out, that was Sonic X. And uh, then the producers of Kirby, the same production team that was dubbing Kirby right back at you, w which uh, they knew my work from that, they were dubbing Sonic X. Some people had a problem with that. That's just the way things work. But they were very interested in having the audition for Dr. Eggman. So one day got a call while I was, I think, on my way home from work uh, from the producer. We'd really love you to uh, do Sonic X. We're going to send you some samples of this guy who did it before and they sent me a whole bunch of game clips from Dean Bristow. Sound like him. Okay. So I took all these sound files. I'm Dean Bristow. Rah, 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 rah. I'm gonna start sounding like this. Rah, 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 rah. Went into my first audition, did my brilliant Dean Bristow impression. I'm Dean Bristow. Rah, 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 sound like rah, 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 rah. That's all I could do. Thought it went well. They thought they needed a call back. They called me back. Did the exact same thing. Okay, I'm Dean Bristol. Rah, 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 Dean Bristol. Rah, rah. Thought it was okay. They called me back a second time. My third visit, I'm Dean Bristol. Rah, 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 rah. Finally, somehow that convinced Sega that, okay, good enough. And Sonic X became a thing. Of course, uh, it wasn't just uh, Dr. Eggman that you kind of like got to be a part of the project. You get to provide your voice for a secondary character as well. Sure. Uh, tell a little bit about that. One or two episodes into the record, 
uh, the character of Ella the Maid came up in conversation. Uh, the producer, Michael Hagney, uh, asked director Andrew Reynolds, now of TV fame, do we have anyone to voice Ella the Maid? No, not yet. Why not have Mike do it? Excuse me. Okay. I said, don't, don't you have like women? Hey guys, just fix these technical issues. So I was going to try and get it back on as soon as we no, can. No, no, you try it. Okay. What did you have in mind? Some sort of Latina maid, female figure, not too offensive. Okay. How about something like this? I hope no one's offended now because that's the voice I ended up doing. <laughs> Gave them a read of that. Put it down on, uh, on the digital Sorry about recorder. that, guys. Roll back to your that schedule. That. Heard nothing back about it. Went back the next week for my next Dr. Eggman record. Any word on that Ella thing? Is that a thing? Oh, no, we got someone else to do it. All right, then. Came back a week later. Oh, by the way, that other person that's going to do it is now you. Okay, so suddenly, I met her the day. Oh, well. Can't go wrong with that. <laughs> So, with uh, your career going into voice acting, uh, the, com the common thing with anime uh, voice, act uh, voice acting is you ha you're going through ADR, which is uh, audio dialogue replacement. Um, how was that for you to kind of like uh, get into that style of uh, recording, being able to, you know, look at the footage, try and match the lip flaps and whatnot? How, how did you kind of like, uh, you know, uh, work with that? My radio career had me all audio based, which is how I prefer to work. You close your eyes or you read a script, you don't worry about any of the pictures, you're creating theater of the mind, it's all in your head, no little extraneous video action. Not the case for dubbing stuff. So the first uh, anime thing I booked, a, uh, if you're really desperate to look for it, it's called Demon Fighter Kocho. Some story about demons and cards and throwing and I don't know what it was about. But I sent a demo tape to uh, Michael Center Nicholas at NYAV Post, later to be Leonardo of the Ninja Turtles and other stuff. And he seemed to like it, and he called me in to uh, read for this thing. He handed me a videotape, a VHS tape at the time, and said, here, take this home and watch it, which was in Japanese. He said, I don't know what's going on. I don't understand. He said, it's fine. You'll be fine. He brought me into the booth, handed me a script, and within the first... 15 minutes or so, I figured out, okay, we're matching the lip flap on the screen. I guess I can kind of do that. The magic of, of ADR these days, thanks to digital technology, they can really do a lot of massaging of the audio, stretching and squeezing and making it fit. So I'm not really that good at dubbing, but with cutting and pasting and losing breaths and adding breaths and adding spaces and stretching and squeezing, it looks a lot better than it does. So obviously it's, it's, it's gotten easier over time with yeah. your career there. It's definitely a collaborative effort. I do it as well as I can. They'll get me to do it a couple of times until it looks pretty close. Then they fix it. Right, so probably the, big thing, the biggest event that happened uh, while you were kind of like working with four kids was the, the massive recasting uh, back in 2009-2010 and uh, many people would lead to believe that uh, you know the only reason why you were there was just basically oh you, do, you just tag along for the ride but it wasn't that easy wasn't it tell, tell us about it I was sitting at home minding my own business in my little home studio watching the auditions pour in recording them sending them back out as I do and I got a call from a West Coast agent that I had started working with she hadn't really done anything for me before. She wasn't great. Um, but apparently, Sega had contacted her and they contacted me to say, yes, I have this audition for you. It's a role I think you've done before. A Dr. Eggman? Yes, Dr. Eggman. I thought I was still doing that. Well, apparently not. They're going to have more auditions. Okay. She sent me the sides. Sides are a breakdown of the character, what describing the character, his age, what he sounds like, what he looks like, what he does, and some sample dialogue. He said, yep, he looks awfully familiar. Do an at-home audition. So I did. And I did exactly what I'd been doing up until that point. I'm Dr. Eggman. I'm reading whatever dialogue you want me to read. Hope you like it. Bye. <laughs> Send it off. And a couple of weeks went by as I wondered, what the heck's going on here? And I was uh, called to say, so you booked this game that we're doing. Oh, good. I thought I'd been doing that already, but great to be back. 
Um, the favorite side note of this uh, West Coast agent, she didn't understand how time zones worked. I'm in New York usually, she's in LA. Uh, LA is three hours behind. So she sent me the thing for the booking saying, and you're booked Monday at nine o'clock. Nine o'clock, is that Eastern or Pacific time? Nine o'clock. Because if it's Pacific time, then that's gonna be noon for me. And if it's Eastern time, that's gonna be 6 a.m. for them. That's not really, nine o'clock. Went into the studio in New York, nine o'clock. Oh, you're not scheduled till noon. Yeah, I figured. I'll be at Starbucks if you, dark in here. I'll be at Starbucks if you need me. So I sat at Starbucks, went into the studio to record Sonic Generations. And, uh, no, uh, I'm sorry, that was Sonic Colors first. And uh, I had to address the issue of whether I was the only one from the old cast along for the ride. Didn't know properly how to broach the question because it was just me in a room with an engineer and then everybody from LA on headphones over the internet. And so I said, hi, I'm Mike. Am I the only one from New York that's doing this? Because I'll probably see some of my old friends and there'll be questions they might want to have answered. And lovely Jack Fletcher, very extremely talented director said, you're the only one as far as I know. Okay. And that was that. I, uh, that started round two of the experience. And with round two, um, it came to kind of like opening up a new side of you with uh, obviously Sonic Boom, um, with uh, the recent games. You've had a much more better time of like kind of like opening up your character and you know, pretty much evolving the character. Quickly go around of how you kind of like felt, felt of evolving the character of you know, with working with the writing team for both, uh, not only for the games, but also for the recent TV series, Sonic Boom, with the writers of that team as well, so. What, what, what was the kind of like, how, how was that kind of like sure. feeling to evolve? There were several evolutions that started in Sonic X. The first couple episodes sounded like Dean Bristow. And then they realized, you know, there's gonna be uh, some more comedy than we thought. So work on some peaks and valleys in your delivery. And the template that uh, director Andrew Reynolds gave me was Martin Short's um, Jiminy Glick character, who starts up way up high and then goes way down low. So that's how Dr. Eggman had lots of peaks and lots of valleys. That was the first little change that happened. Uh, there were also, for example, in the dreaded Sonic 06. I'll give you a moment, thank you. When the script for that came in and the redesign came in, uh, obviously a much darker side of the character, so I was able to give it a much darker and intense tone while still keeping it with the Eggman voice that I morphed into. And then when we reached the recasting and colors in Generations and there was more comedy, there was more room to play for the comedy. I'm a comedy guy, made me really happy. And it went from a different type of, oh, perhaps corny is the word, for the Sonic X comedy, uh, to a more cerebral, intelligent, and makes you think kind of comedy that I really liked. And that especially worked out when we got into Sonic Boom where you get to see Eggman at home, Eggman arguing with the city government, that sort of thing. Really turning him from a villain into your curmudgeonly na neighbor from next door. Hey you kids, get off my lawn! Thank you. Great, thanks very much for your time, Mike. Thank um, you. Of course, uh, you have a website that people can go and visit to see what uh, you've want done in the past and also maybe even, you know, paying them a little bit to uh, have you work on some projects maybe. What's that, all, uh, what's your website? Sure, it's itsamike.com, I-T-S-A-M-I-K-E.com. Also, it's a Mike on Facebook and Twitter. Yeah. So go check them out, guys. So, Mike, it's been a pleasure Thank to you have so you much. here. Thank you for listening. Thank you so yeah. much. Thank you very much, everybody, for standing here. And uh, enjoy the rest of Summer of Sonic. Have a good time. And see you later. Take care. Bye-bye. See ya. Ha-ha. Ha-ha. <laughs>